There are plenty of people in the world who are eager to throw their ideas and opinions at you, who want to tell you what you should care about, what you should believe, what you should think, and how you should live your life. But this is not that. Instead, the purpose of the mirror is to take you on a journey inside your own mind, to let you explore the inner world of your own thought processes. The mirror is not about what facts you know or how smart you are. It's about exploring what you believe, how you see the world, and why. An interactive process where the way you answer certain questions determines where you will go and what you will discover next. In here, you are the scientist and the subject. You are the doctor and the patient. In here, you will decide what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. But be warned, while digging into the inner workings of your own thoughts, you may discover things you didn't know were there, things that may make you uncertain and uncomfortable. So the first, and perhaps the most important question, is this. If, for whatever reason, you weren't seeing the world as it really is, if certain misunderstandings and false assumptions were causing you to think things and do things which go against what you really believe in and who you really are, would you want to know about it? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today I have Amanda Rackwitz, the dragon uh, anarchist. I have been trying to get her on for the past few months. She is like a slippery fish. She's more difficult to get on than Lark and Rose, so don't even try. No, no, you can try. Oh, God. <laughs> you can try. Okay, so. not that difficult. <laughs> parents and the internet no. <laughs> so um so so she's got you can find her on facebook um as a and amanda rockwitz but also her facebook page is the dragon anarchist and also her youtube channel is called the dragon anarchist uh and you can find her on the dragon com. so give her props for consistency uh <laughs> so, so yeah. i, I want to talk about some some topics uh like the mirror the the project that she's helping uh Larkin with and um and also maybe you know if you can talk a little bit about you know um Larkin's approach to psychology I remember you saying about how he focuses on psychology and how to talk to status because you know it's 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 different than talking to you know people who are logical and then you know and have the, have arrived at their position through logic and reason and then people who have not <laughs> and have just arrived right. at their position because of indoctrination and growing up in the culture and uh, and right. also and, and also maybe we can get into about the marriage license that's always a fun topic uh, i haven't talked about that with many people in a while and and you're also a big gamer right so uh so we'll get your take on that um so amanda thanks a lot for coming on the show uh you're welcome and i'm happy to be here and i'm sorry it was semi difficult to <laughs> coordinate <laughs> with me i actually hope to have that not be as true going forward <laughs> um, i do want to be more available and uh, I sort of got lucky when I had the idea. I've always had a thing for dragons, and when I had the idea to make my thing centered around dragons and make you know be the dragon anarchist and stuff, um, I was like, what are the chances that I'm going to have the dragon anarchist as an open, available name for all these sites? And it worked out great. I mean, Go, uh, GoDaddy had the domain open, and YouTube had the username open, and like and. Uh, oh, my Instagram, which I told you, I just made. Right. Um, I didn't. I haven't had one really yet up to this point. I just launched it the other day, um, and that was an available username. And so, on not a single thing anywhere have I had to like add a weird extension to that, or add numbers into the website, or you know whatever. Um, but I haven't had to do anything weird. Like the the name is like just out there and available. No one else has it. So. <laughs> Because you're just weird this way. Nobody, nobody thought of it before. You're like, <laughs> you're right. the first one. How many people are like dragons? The, Anarchy. Yeah, clearly, yeah. those go together. Clearly, clearly, <laughs> undeniably. <laughs> right. So, so before you get into any of the, those topics, can you go into a little bit of your background in, uh, you know, how you became a voluntarist and an anarchist, and what, uh, you know, books or podcasts um, stimulated your development? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I will say this. I started. Um, I had I have a very sort of all over the place weird path. Um, I grew up as a 
just in a conservative Christian household, um, I didn't think actively about politics much other than the super opinionated people I was around when it was time to talk about politics, you know what I mean? So I sort of had all the opinions of my parents because I parroted that uh, the way most people do. Um, and I hadn't really, um, it didn't, hadn't really occurred to me that things that had been presented in my world as a certain, um, a certain way, uh, it didn't occur to me that those things could be very, very different from the way they were presented um, until I met the man who's my husband now. And he was, he has, you know, 20 years on me of just reading and reading and reading. He's just heavy into reading about anything he could get his hands on. He loved fiction too, and he was into fantasy stuff like I was. Um, but he was just a curious person, and he's read so many kinds of books about different kinds of topics, you know, nonfiction. And so he was a fascinating person to talk to because he had all kinds of knowledge about things I had never considered. And so he was um, he was not an anarchist yet or, or anything, but he uh, was aware of a few problems. Like he was aware of the fraudulent, you know, thing that the Federal Reserve is, you know, the fact that it's you know, a, a private entity owned by, you know, a private businessmen who are bankers or whatever, and it has been since, you know, it, it spawned out of nowhere in 1913. Um, and so he knew about all that, and he introduced me to some of these ideas slowly. And I was the typical program statist in that I had this, these sort of emotional reactions to him suggesting that this kind of conspiratorial stuff was going on. Um, if for no other reason than I had been sort of programmed to to just react to that as something crazy. And the thing is, is I couldn't consciously think of anyone in my life ever having said, you know, well, anyone who mentions that this narrative isn't this narrative is a conspiracy theorist. I'd never had anyone say those, anyone who says otherwise is crazy. I never, I couldn't consciously think of anyone having demonized people who thought like my husband. And yet somehow this programming was there and it was I remember the term conspiracy theorist coming out of my mouth and like <laughs> coming into my brain out of nowhere and I wasn't even sure where that came from and I wasn't even sure why I thought he was crazy and it took some introspecting to even become conscious of that but he had suggested a few things might be not the way they were presented um the whole tax system being one and uh and so I sort of shot him down on some of those topics and then a little while later and he wasn't pushy he was just like you aren't somebody who's ever looked into these things and I have if you want to look into them and then you want to talk to me about it and we're then we'll be on the same level because we'll have both reviewed the data then you're welcome to google that and look into it and uh, I ignored all that I didn't want to google anything about that sort of thing <laughs> for a while <laughs> and I just thought I was sweeping under the rug um but one particular night where, you know, we had a disagreement over something, I remember coming away from that going, why do I have a problem with going to look into this myself? And why is it I just don't like this idea? Like, what is this uncomfortable feeling I have? So I was at least conscious enough to do that. I can give myself that much credit. Um, and I thought to myself, I am afraid he's right. And that's why I don't want to go look. <laughs> so then I sort of got this weird defiantness towards myself in that moment. Because it was like, if it's true, why are we afraid of it? Are we really afraid of things that are true? Like, if it's true, wouldn't I want to know? Because I'm not, I'm not a little chicken shit. I shouldn't be afraid of the truth. So it was sort of my self-image. This self-image of someone who's like, no, I'm, I'm curious and I care about the truth. And I'm not afraid of it. Um, that sort of image of myself that sort of kicked in at that point. And I thought, well, I should, I'm going to Google this stuff. And, you know, the more I started looking into stuff, the more it was like, wow. So things are not just obviously the way the media has been portraying them to me for so many years. Things are not just obviously a certain way. Um, and there's actually a lot of legitimate reasons to believe that things are this way. And that experience was what sort of at least, I think, just made me more open. So at this point it was like, okay, I'm at least open with the fact now that the world is not the way it's being presented to me and there could be a lot of other things that are true that I don't know about. So from there I sort of 
went on with life and I didn't do much in the way of just researching more or doing much more for a little while. And then uh, Tom and I um, moved, relocated back to New Jersey for a few years to be near his kids who are much older. And we were there and I had a weird sort of person I stumbled across on the internet who was actually in more of like the new agey stuff. And I don't necessarily think anymore that this guy is, um, um, knows what he's talking about on a lot of things. But he was one of these sort of new agey types that was really into the aliens and stuff. But what was fascinating about him, what I didn't know about, was all these fine details of like the Federal Reserve history and history of like other countries and what actual wars were about, not what they were, you know, said they were about. There was all this stuff that he had been researching and he had a lot of actually documented good stuff on that. And I found that really fascinating and that sort of blew the lid on a bunch of other things for me. And that's when I was like just hungry to learn more. You know, I want to learn more, I want to discover more, whatever. And then, um, and then I just, you know, I stumbled across um, Tragedy and Hope, where Richard Grove and Lisa Arbacheski have done a whole bunch of work in putting together verifiable real history and connecting the dots of what our history's actually been. Um, and they sort of teamed up with John Taylor Gatto, who wrote The Underground History of American Education um, and is known for being, you know, the New York school teacher for like 30 years. And he wrote the whole book on just that indoctrination system. And I, that, you know, was a huge point in moving me towards liberty and just towards the way people should actually live and be free. And then I stumbled across the video that I mentioned on Jeff's podcast, um, on Anarchast, which was the philosophy of liberty, which mm -hmm. is a great little animated video that sort of describes it. And it was right around that time that I saw that vi I saw that video and I had been toying with the whole idea of what government, you know, if it exists, should really look like. And I took that video and just was applying it to different areas of life, different scenarios and where it was just an individual and an individual because that video broke it down to the individual level. And I thought there's no legitimate way in which someone who wasn't doing anything to this person over here um, where this person over here gets to come over and initiate aggression onto like steal or force someone over here to do what they want. There's no way to make that okay. Even if it's this, even if it's this person walks into this person's business and they think that they're like slightly rude to them or that person goes, I don't want to serve you here. And then they're like mad. This person does not get to then try to make that person give up their money via the threat of force, mm -hmm. which blew the lid on the whole, you know, um, you can't discriminate against me and make me leave your restaurant like media thing, which is designed to make it all about you're supposed to be nice to people and serve everyone. And that's the guise under which it's made into this moral issue when really it's the reverse. It's using people's feelings to justify thought police, which is, you know, you have a thought about me I don't like. And therefore, I want to be able to rob you because I want to be able to make you give up your goods and services, you know, via the threat of force. Um, and that I got to anarchy sort of over a path of maybe several days or weeks through that. And, and Ron Paul was a big thing for me right around the same time. So I had those two things compounded. I was hearing Ron Paul and excited about him and hoping that he could educate a bunch of people on Liberty. And then I saw that video and then I was like, government just, I watched it just demolish in front of my face and it just went away and was like there's there's no such thing as legitimate government it it can't exist and as soon as that clicked i had never even thought about anarchy before but as soon as it clicked my brain like reached for the word it was like there's a word for that <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like holy crap i'm an anarchist cuz my brain just remembered anarchy literally means no rulers and i thought well that's what i am then mm -hmm. And and I even sort of philosophically understood that was the correct term to use because even though it had been turned into chaos before, I thought, well, that literally just means no rulers. And I've just discovered that there's no such thing as a legitimate one at all. So I guess I'm an anarchist. And and then right, right at that time, I stumbled across a video of Larkin Rose and I thought, well, this guy puts it in like idiot proof speak. <laughs> and like, <All> right. <laughs> and I was just excited because I was like, you could just say these things like that way and people will, and it just makes so much sense. That's amazing. And so, um, you know, and from there it was just, you know, gradual, just 
more and more and more and getting more curious about who else was out there, who else was talking about this stuff, linking up with people online and, you know, same story a lot of us have. So uh, that was me, just average everyday status who hadn't really thought about anything. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's really amazing. Like um, the, the how we all come to this through this natural progression, you know, most of us, I guess, um, of of reading and learning and, and, and teaching yourself and then applying that to the real world. And right. uh, and then it, it kind of like you said, it just disappears. Like, why do we need it at all? You know, and uh, and and you know, when you when you when you call yourself an anarchist for the first time, I think that's a pretty jarring experience. And and especially, I guess, when you tell your family about it <laughs> and your close <laughs> friends, and uh, and then you got to break them break it down because you know everybody has an emotional reaction. Like you said, like. Um, statism is not built on a foundation of logic or reason, no. right? It's built on a foundation of nationalism, emotional attachment, you know, rep the reptilian brain, you know, all instinct, nothing to do with logic, reason, or anything that has to do with a human being <laughs> at all, right. Right. <laughs> right? They appeal to the basest parts of our brain, and, and that's the only way that you can rule, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and I think too the base, the part that's the base part that is, I think, um, it, it's sort of weird to say this, but brilliant about the notion of government. And I, I don't mean, I don't mean the piles of ignorant minions that are most of government. I mean the people who, you know, are more like the businessmen that are at the very, very, very top. That are the people that would be sociopaths to their grave to try to control other humans that know exactly what they're doing. Um, and those people, like the people that started the New Education Foundation, that was a big made was a big part in developing American compulsory schooling, um, to make that all about turning people into obedient soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, that those people, they're brilliant in this one sense. They understood that um, the base need for a sense of security in human beings, which is a naturally good thing because it's our sense of security that helps us serve our sense of our desire for security that helps us survive mm -hmm. but it's playing on that to try to increase that to this unhealthy degree mm -hmm. see there's a billion unknowns in the natural world and those unknowns um and those risks um that in a way are always a threat to our security um are also the things we have to go out and interact with and learn about and and be out in it in order to grow and expand our knowledge and our influence and um, the kind of um, person we are and enrich our lives. We have to go out into that scary world. And so if our need for security um, begins to get so high that it's trumping our ability to do anything in the world, like learn and discover and innovate and do any of those things, then that desire for security has become an inhibitor that's like a mental health issue almost um, because it's, it's, it's too high. And the reason that it's too high is because our fear is too high. And so the whole idea of government spawning at all comes from some humans who were smarter than your average burglar, your average mugger or whatever, in that they thought, how do I get what I want from people um, in, you know, in enormous amounts of just material stuff and just their time and how do I suck everything I want away from people and control them uh, long term without the immediate consequences of them defending themselves against me. Like the burglar doesn't think about the immediate consequences really of that person in the house who might try to defend themselves and might kill the burglar, he's just focused on the short term of, I just want to meet this need right now by force. Mm. He's not planning for the long term. A sociopath that wants to control people goes, how do I train people to see me, the burglar, as their protector? Mm. So that they will give up everything because they will be convinced that I'm protecting them from the scary stuff out there and the the boogeyman and the guy that's down the street that's the scary sex offender. So, oh my gosh, I need to, <laughs> like, this guy needs to protect me and make a bunch of rules that everyone has to follow and surveil everyone. And that's what it does. So it's twisted in that it actually takes a naturally good thing humans have, which is a desire to survive and to have some sense of security, to you know, build a home that can at least provide for that 
day-to-day security from the elements and have food and expand our you know level of living to provide certain levels of security it takes that and it just magnifies it to an irrational degree so that humans don't even live we don't we don't go out and develop ourselves we don't innovate we don't take any risks we just stay fearful hunker down and we don't do anything with ourselves and we just are afraid of everything down to you know what somebody says day to day online and now that's a big deal because our feelings are hurt and now we're afraid of things like you know being offended and so that is you know to me the brilliance in quotes of government in an evil totally evil way it's the actual brilliance that's behind people that do know what they're doing and i think the highest level politicians they're they're doing a job and they know what that job is and you know they speak in fallacies all the time and maybe not all of them but i think a good majority of them they know logic and that's how they know how to manipulate human brains. If you understand how to what logic is, then you know that if you train someone else to think in fallacies while tapping into their emotions, you can make them think in contradictory terms all the time. So they hold contradictory beliefs inside that don't make any sense. Mm. And you can look at a lot of these politicians and where they went to school and their history. And they were taught things that people in American compulsory school weren't, like logic, grammar, and rhetoric. They went to, through the classical disciplines. So some of these people know exactly what they're doing, but they speak like retards because they're trying to speak like the masses are thinking now and are trained to receive <laughs> things. Like the masses are trained now to go, oh, right. someone scary is over there. Must kill them. And so <laughs> they don't ask questions. And so the right. other person, so these politicians can get up and say things that to people who know logic go, that's stupid. That doesn't make any sense. Well, a lot of them... Out- a lot of them know better. They know exactly what they're doing. That's right. why what, everything they're saying is dumb because they're not trying to speak logically to the masses. They're trying to appeal to that base desire that you and I talked about that's just, I need to survive mm. and I need to be secure. And they're blowing that up and they're they're just making that irrationally intense for people because of fear, 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 fear. And so government is just this thing that turns uh, our desire for some security into this irrational need to have freaking padded walls around us <laughs> and that's why people are status it's not even because they're so it's not because they're necessarily violent or they really just want to go around hurting their neighbor all the time it's more because they think defensively like they think well everyone else is out to get me so i need the state mm. to protect me from everyone else that's out to get me <laughs> yeah. so that's why you all that crap. It reminds me of a, of a Mark Twain quote. Um, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled, right? And and uh, mm-hmm. the bamboozle is the, the you know the lie is the first thing that we have to recognize and overcome. And once you overcome that hurdle, everything else kind of falls into place and it becomes much easier to to look at the world a little bit differently. But but before you do that, before you question your own upbringing, your own indoctrination, you can't progress to the next level. So um, right. so so yeah. In in going along with this, can you? talk a little bit about um, the project The Mirror that um, that you and Larkin are working on? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, uh, I what I really want to stress is um, how much this project absolutely totally needs to be just constantly funded. Um, I really hope that there's there are going to be some um, very interested um, uh, liberty-minded investors that will love what Larkin is trying to do and understand it and that'll be at Acapulco too because I you know if I had I tell Larkin almost every day I'm like if I had a million dollars I would throw it at you so you could do this because what he basically has to do is um, create an interactive computer animated world um, that's basically a really huge if then chart so there's a million questions well not a million but a lot I'm just exaggerating for effect here um, million questions that it's going to ask someone, but it depending on their answer depends on where the questions are going to go. Or it depends on, you know, yeah. So if they answer yes or no to this, then it's going to go over here. And, you know, if you imagine like a novel's worth of writing that way, in addition to the fact that he's working in one of the most complicated uh, software programs out there that it's open source and free, but it's so complicated to use that most people give up before they get started in it. And he's working in Blender. And then he's doing this while, while he's not, it has to be free. It's something that 
for it to work and for it to spread and get to the most people. He doesn't want it to cost anything. And so he's getting no return for this thing. And it's going to, and he's doing as far as, as far as programming and animation, he's doing what would normally take, like if it were the length of it and the content of it, it would be like what would normally take a few hundred, a hundred people maybe on a team combined with, you know, programmers and animators like you would see for a movie to tackle what he's doing because of the content, the length of it and the work involved. But one guy's doing it while also trying to stay afloat, uh, trying to stay afloat and pay bills and take care of things, which is actually, you know, a lot easier said than done. And he, so he's constantly, if he has to constantly focus on trying to survive, which a lot of the time he does, um, he can't put as much time as he wants to just be, you know, to just hunker down and work on this. So, you know, it could take, if it didn't, if it doesn't get serious funding or enough funding or whatever, it could take years. And it's such a mass, because it's such a massive project. He's one guy doing what, you know, would take a lot of normally like a team of a hundred people to do. Mm. And, and the reason that he's the only one that can do it is because he's got an unusual combination of knowledge um, where he sort of understands the status brain because he's been, he's spent, you know, a vigorous 20 years arguing with people and been an anarchist for a long time. He understands their, their brain really well. And he understands the progression of questions and the preciseness with which this program needs to be written for them. And he understands sort of the visual aesthetics, like this can't look too much like any one, you know, major media Hollywood thing or movie or anything like that. But it still has to look aesthetically appealing just enough, at least weird enough, to be intriguing. And so he understands a lot of elements of this project that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily understand. And he ha- and he knows exactly how it needs to be. And so it's also not one of those things that can be worked on by multiple people, really. It's like it really has to be fully designed by him because he's got exactly how it needs to go in his mind. So it's like he's going to take a long time to do it. Now, if somebody threw a huge amount of money at him so that he could, you know, take care of bills and everything like that and live and just pour all his time into this for a good while, then it would get finished that much sooner. But because it's such a massive project, it's hard to see like the light at the end of the tunnel right now and even guess, especially when he doesn't, doesn't have a lot of funding. Um, now that I've been really close to the project and I talked to him so much about it for hours and hours and I've worked with recording on it or whatever, I really believe in the project. And I mean, really, like I, there's so many ways in which it's genius and I really believe he knows exactly how it needs to be and he can totally do it, um, you know, but since the feds totally smashed his finances and his business and whatever all those years ago over the 861 thing, which is what, you know, he's really known for, um, you know, it's sort of like being under mountains of stuff and trying to constantly like dig your way out of that while also trying to have enough time to, to do this big thing over here. That's this mountain of a project. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really passionate about it and I really want to see people, um, just throw all their support behind that because I think it's one of those things that it's it, it might be the best you know waking people up and furthering the idea of liberty project that exists out there right now at, that I've heard of at all I mean it's, you know maybe the only thing that would be really close next to that is just the assistance of the existence of Bitcoin in that currency freeing people up and stuff but um that's a huge, I think Bitcoin is going to be huge for Liberty too, but this is more potent because it goes right to the deprogramming of people. And it's non-threatening because he understands human psychology. He understands this needs to be something that is an aloof, disinterested thing that they can explore and they are totally the pilot of the whole thing. They get to decide how long they're in it. They get to run away when they want to. They get to dig into it when they want to and they understand that they are digging into the workings of their own brain. And at every step, it's, you know, basically like, you know, trying to intrigue them enough to want to go on but also just let them know, like, you know, you you know, it's up to you. Do you want to go deeper? Do you want to discover what you really think and how you really see the world? Do you want to uncover things that are not consistent? Um, like, so we, that's why in the trailer, one of the, the very first question is, if the way you see things 
are not how things really are, would you want to know? And they can start with like, yes or no. And so it's their choice to, you know, jump in. That's why it's the mirror. It's their choice to take a look at their own brain. And it's not about anybody's opinion and anything. And it'll be one of those things that it shows them what they've done along the way. So they'll be able to look and go, okay, these are the answers I've given. And they'll be able to, and, and it'll be able to show them, you know, here you said this. And over here you said this. And they can look at their own mind and see that didn't line up with what I said over here. <laughs> so I'm contradicting myself, which is it kind of a thing. Mm. Um, but in a non-threatening way the whole way through and in this way that leads them very carefully. So the idea is that if they, the idea is that if they finish it at all, other than choosing to just, you know, sort of quit or back out or whatever, and they don't want to go to the end conclusion. If they really finish it, then they're basically an anarchist by the end of it. So and so, so well, real quick. So so so, how far in the the question tree does the program call the person a racist? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's here the, you the, said this here you said this <laughs> some might call that no um no the, one of the brilliant things about it and i don't even again i don't even know fully how larkin's gonna pull this off because only he understands how it's got to be and he's the one working on the project but um one of the things is that the program uh, at no point will the narrator me mm-hmm. <laughs> uh at no point will the disinterested uh narrator who's guiding them through the program assert anything like make us claim, like tell them anything about what they think. Do, do, you, do you know? You, do you even econ, bro? It, like <laughs> right, like at, because the whole point is that it's got it has to hold their natural defensiveness and their belief mm-hmm. that they're basically a good person and that they're right. It has to hold that in mind at all times at the forefront of what the program's doing. It has to remember they, you know, nobody wants to feel like you're trying to go. You're wrong. You're wrong. And so right. it that's the other thing that's tricky about it. And that's why the more I understood the program and then what he wanted to do, the more I was like, okay, one, this will change the world. All it needs is a good marketing program behind it once it's done. Mm. Um, and two, now I know why only you can do this because mm. I talked to him enough about it and understood enough about it and then saw enough what he was doing with the way it looked and I realized – yeah, he knows how it needs to look. He knows how it needs to be. He knows exactly how it needs to go. And it's complex enough and it's a big enough job that, you know, only he could do it. But, um, you know, my my dream would be to just, you know, in a way sort of make the universe pay back Larkin for what the feds did to him. Just, you know, fund him enough to not only have all of that stuff that, you know, messed up their you know, the Rose family's finances for years, whatever, and, and made things difficult for him, like clear that debt out of the way and get that done with, but then fund him into the future so that he can just put all his energy into this. Because that's what he wants to do. He wants to be able to spend all his time working on this thing. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do when you're also the provider for the family and you're trying to bring in enough to pay, you know, expenses and bills and things like that. So um, I'm really excited about Anarchopoco because they're going to be, you know, Jeff Berwick and, uh, and, um, also Nathan Freeman's like the event coordinator and stuff and organizer for it. Um, they're just getting together a really awesome group of people. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, I do think that, uh, that's going to be a place where people want to be. I think if you're interested in Liberty and if you're interested in, um, actually affecting real change in the world, then it's going to be a really exciting place to be, to be at Anarchapoco 2016 this year, because there's some great people that are going to be there. Yeah, I know. You're, you're, you're rubbing it in for me. Uh, I didn't make it last <laughs> year. I'm probably not going to make it this year. So you're just making me feel worse. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the only, the only, Sorry, uh, love it. the only Liberty Fest that I went to, uh, it was Liberty Fest. <laughs> the only Liberty event was Liberty Fest, uh, which is in Brooklyn. Very, this is like, I guess the closest one to me. And I was there twice. And uh, that was an awesome experience um, meeting like Adam Kokesh and, and oh, yeah. Jeffrey Tucker and 
Carlos Morales. And you know, it's, it's so amazing, you know, when you when you go to these places and you only know these people through their YouTube channel, through Facebook, and then you actually meet them. Right. You're like, wait a minute, you're just a human being. <laughs> you're just a mortal like me. Man, I can touch oh, you. Oh, you're that, real. Oh, that's a disappointment. You're a <laughs> no. but, but, oh, you're a squishy mortal. Who knew? <laughs> I know, I know, and and it's uh, yeah, it's amazing that you know I, I was able to talk to these people and also get little interviews with them, you know, from my channel, which is really cool, uh, because so many of them are so busy that the, that it's just hard to get a hold of them to to, to interview them, and so um, yeah, so it's just just a, a wonderful thing to be around liberty minded people, and uh, and you know, Liberty Fest is not necessarily an uh, an anarchist or voluntarist uh, meeting, right? It's just liber general libertarian, but right. Anarchopulco is like you know primarily anarchist which is really awesome um yes. you know i just uh, i can't imagine it and you know we went we visited um um uh, Asheville, north carolina uh, where a bunch of volunteers live down there and peaceful parenting types and that was a really awesome experience you know just being around people like that it's just 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 an amazing experience hard to duplicate <laughs> you know? yeah it is and i you know i've been to a few liberty events i've not been to pork fest um or any of the major ones like you know um the the uh, Free Your Mind Conference or Libertopia or any of those. Um, but I've been to um, Ernie Hancock of Freedoms Phoenix. He lives in er, Phoenix, Arizona. I've been to his house and I've been there to uh, meet Richard Grove and Lisa Arbacheski from Tragedy and Hope Productions. Um, and I've been there to hang out with Adam Kokesh and Macy when they were on their Freedom Tour and got to hang out with Adam in the trailer and talk to him. And, of course, I've been to Jackalope Fest, which is a small but quickly growing um, northern northeastern Arizona Liberty Festival for anarchists. Um, and I've been to that. And that, that's actually where I met Larkin Rose when he did his very last tour before he retired mm. to focus on the mirror. Um, I met him at, uh, at Jackalope. Um, and every single time I've been to around, around these people in general, all of them, that I've met. It's just been some of the highest caliber conversation that I've ever had. I mean, the I meet like nothing short of interesting, intelligent people there who are a pleasure to talk to, who are kind, who are really open, who are curious, who are just um, innovating and ready to come up with new ideas, ready to jump at anything. I've watched people, I've watched anarchists so often show up with cash in hand at places and they just throw their money at anyone that they think has a, is doing great and has some, is furthering the idea really well or has some great idea. I, I've watched them slap money into each other's hands. Like they, <laughs> they walk the talk and they are passionate and they, love meeting new people and they're just a lot they're just great so it, it does spoil you because so, so you didn't see any you, then you go so no molotov cocktails at, the, at the, any of the anarchist <laughs> meetings you didn't see any of them <laughs> nothing Needless <laughs> not even sick. one no. serious what kind of anarchists are these <laughs> no the worst we <laughs> the worst we had was i think there's one guy who showed up in an event and he showed up at someone's house and um he, he just didn't get the message that like this was a bunch of people who are like mostly anarchists mm. and that's fine. I'm fine that he showed up. I wasn't like, it's not like I'm thinking, Oh, status shouldn't come. No status should come. But he was very into the political movement and mm. getting, you know, getting these laws like, um, you know, reduced or repealed, getting, you know, petitions were big to him. He was really about like activating people on petitions <laughs> and he didn't get that. He was in a place where most of us have been past that for like a while. <laughs> like we're like, dude, you're not fixing anything. With <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're, I mean, we weren't like that. It was, it was really cool to watch because he was so enthusiastic. I mean, really enthusiastic. Um, and so it, it was one of the, it was one of those guys that you didn't like, you didn't want to just, you weren't going to crush him. You weren't just going to like crush his dreams and be like, no, you know, fuck you. We're <laughs> anarchists, you know, and yeah, just yeah, yeah. tell the guy to leave. Everyone was super nice to him and they would just listen to him. He would just ramble on and on about how much you got to petition and get these laws to come, you know, so we can, uh, you know, make ourselves more free, kind of a longer leash thing. And he just didn't realize he was in a group of people who weren't really. Like we weren't really like slavery light. Like let's inter <laughs> still try to be in government to shrink government. Mm -hmm. Like he was very about that. And so people were gently presenting like 
what we thought and letting him know what we thought and uh, and then just hearing him out and listening to him. And, you know, he went away all jazzed and excited at the end of the night. And I, I think at the end of the night, he still had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he was really into getting this political stuff going. He was all about that. And it was just cool to see that everyone was nothing but nice to him and kind to him. You know, no one was like rude or trying to be rough or abrasive or burst his bubble. Um, you know, everyone was sort of honest and stuff, but most people were willing to listen to him. So it's just been nothing but uh, an honor to be around uh, liberty-minded people and anarchists because they really get it. <laughs> so, so, so b- before we sign off, I just I just have to ask you one one more question. Uh, since you mentioned Adam Kokesh and uh, and uh, you know the idea of uh, shrinking government from within. What is your opinion on Adam Kokesh's uh, 2020 uh, run for the president on the peaceful on the platform of peaceful dissolution of the federal government? Um, I haven't talked to Adam a lot, or like I met him for in March, I think it was, and so I didn't talk to him about running for president at the time. I you know had a short conversation with him in the trailer when we were all there. My husband and I were there, and we talked to him and. Macy briefly. Um, so, and I haven't seen his recent videos about specifically that, like why he's wanting to do it. Um, so you might not, you might know better than me, but my take on it without having talked to him or my guess knowing Adam is that one, um, he doesn't, he wouldn't actually want to be someone who um, was doing anything in the political realm that would be could be deemed as um, enforcing anything, like coercion, like just if he got into that role, it would strictly be to attempt to dissolve the power that government has and basically end up with, you know, far fewer government minions because he helped to dissolve a bunch of that. I don't think almost everyone else I've ever run into um, that has any interest in trying to, you know, change the system from within um there's almost always this level of of some kind of ego involved you know there's a lot of people who i think just would have no problems taking a government paycheck and thinking well i'm you know i'm getting a nice government paycheck and you know i'm working towards liberty but mostly i'm getting a nice paycheck and there are people who i'd be um i guess i would suspect um if they wanted to run for office but i don't I, I've heard enough out of Adam's mouth that I don't think that's his his idea at all. And two, I don't think I don't necessarily think that he thinks he actually has a shot. I think that what he's doing, because he doesn't actually want any power, he doesn't actually want to coerce people, he doesn't want to enforce any laws on anyone. I think that what he hopes to actually do is just really blow the lid off the whole anarchism and voluntarism idea in a bigger way. So sort of carry on the flag after Ron Paul. Ron Paul was getting there, but there were a lot of things that Ron Paul, and Ron Paul would say this, that Ron Paul would not say on purpose um, because he was trying not to scare people off. So Ron Paul didn't use the word anarchism. Ron Paul didn't quite go there. Um, He would say things that he didn't necessarily all the way agree with to sort of appease the constitutionalist ears, things like that. Like Ron Paul would be gentler on people. And I think Adam sort of wants to take the education campaign further and get more people about real actual liberty by running with that as his platform, knowing full well they would never allow someone like him to get in because the puppets are still puppets. They still work for someone higher than they are who, you know, people, and they're sort of pre-selected. So someone who's actually got, you know, you know, is going to put a bunch of them out of work is not someone they're going to really let in if they can have anything to do with it. And since the same, you know, people that, you know, own the banks that also are in, you know, in bed with their own government, since those same people that are in control as always have been, I don't see Adam going anywhere. And I, and I don't know, maybe Adam, maybe Adam really thinks that he has a shot. And then if he did actually get the presidency, then he would actually try to, you know, successfully dissolve the federal government. Um, but I think that him running on that platform and doing that at all, like running for president, is just his way to go, well, the world is mostly statist. So if I sound like I'm in their game, then I'll get more attention because people are open to, you know, more than they're open to hearing about anarchy, they're open to, you know, are you a freedom lover and are you trying to, 
you know, do something for me in the political realm. Okay, well, play in the political realm to get statist attention and then shatter their belief in government on the way. <laughs> and I think that that's where, I think that that's the only way in which I would be, I would say, well, okay, I guess I'm okay with what you're doing. Like, I don't think there's a moral issue there. Um, and I think that's what Adam really wants to do. I, I don't get from the guy that this is like an ego thing or like he really, you know, truly thinks that being a politician can be a good thing in any way. I don't think that that's what he wants to do at all. So that that's where I'm at on it. But again, I haven't actually sat down and like talked to the guy about, you know, where do you think this is going to go? And, mm. you know, are you okay with, you know, what if you somehow got the job? That does mean that temporarily you're getting this government paycheck. But do you think that's a problem if you're going to dissolve huge branches of government and then stop a bunch of coercion going on in the world or you know i haven't had that conversation so keep that in mind i don't really know where he's at with that i just know what i've got of the guy so far and what i imagine he hopes to do with it because i know he's a smart guy yeah yeah i think i pretty much agree with you with that and i I think he's he's definitely um more along the educational route like ron paul um and uh yeah i don't know if he actually thinks he's gonna get elected uh i don't know but um i think you know, he can do more good just, uh, yeah, I guess the same reason that Jeff Burke said he was going to run for some office, right? To, to right. just, to just uh, for the educational purpose. So. Um, but, but yeah, so, so um, <laughs> like you said, like if, if he actually does get into office, I would actually be frightened for his life <laughs> because I don't, <laughs> I don't see them reacting well to him saying, all right, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're out of the <laughs> yeah. job, you're out of the job, you're out of the job, <laughs> you know? You right. know, like thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people at the job, and uh, and then you know people on welfare. You know, the, the check stopped. Like what? People are just gonna say, "All right, I guess I don't have any more welfare." <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't see it being as that easy. So um, right, I, and then, well, I think I mean people saw what happened with Ron Paul. All right. the total corruption and obvious just bullshit that was pulled off by the GOP and others. Like it was so clearly and evidently controlled and just manipulated yeah. from people by people that had the resources to manipulate the whole thing and make sure he wasn't going to get very far. Mm. And Ron Paul wasn't even an anarchist or trying to just talk about completely dissolving all the federal government right away. Like he, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't even doing that. Yeah. And he was shut out. So, you know, Adam is a smart guy. I, I think he probably knows that he's not going to get there. And yet, He's going to try because where is the world at? They're, well, most of the world is in politics. Mm-hmm. So get their attention by being in politics and then, uh, you know, and then try to inch by inch get closer to a world that's much less coercive with uh, much less, you know, controlling freaks running around in the world trying to uh, enforce stupid, stupid laws. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, so, well, that's a redundant phrase, stupid laws, but... <laughs> right, but, uh, laws but, uh, are inherently stupid, so... <laughs> well, Oops. well, yeah, so, so some are, like, harmful, some are just unnecessary, some are redundant, um, but, <laughs> but but yeah, well, one thing I'll say before we get, uh, sign off is is Adam's book, Freedom, and, uh, and you know, when, when he said that it was banned by the Department of Justice or something, right, it's banned in prison, and I mean, yeah. I mean, that's just an amazing thing to think about, like, we're in the digital age, the age of the internet, right, with like Pirate Bay and like, you know, you can download anything and a book is banned. What? Right. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you have open source, it's, everything. What? How can you ban a book? <laughs> it's it's really funny because in a way, in a way, it's sort of pathetic. And I think it sort of, I think it sort of reveals how outdated a lot of, wow, I a lot of the people that. that are used to being able to just control the world, the politicians, <laughs> a lot of them. So many of them don't even know how to freaking use computers. Like they pay people to do that for them. And they're kind of out of the loop. And I think they have these old fashioned ways of, well, this is how we're going to scare people and control people. And it's like, and, and what's great is now that there's these new generations of people, like people creating cryptocurrencies who are just laughing in the face of authority. (laughs) And I think that's one of the best things we can do is just fucking laugh in the face of authority (laughs) (laughs) yeah it is just just say you know what like because why laughter if if you are if you think something's funny and you're laughing at it you can't be afraid Mm. and the only way they know how to manipulate people the only reason government exists is through fear Mm. like i said they play on the need for security and they blow that up through fear and so once people are just going (laughs) 
Then nice try. Still going to download a hundred movies a year. Know, right? um, then the, <laughs> FBI then, piracy. Piracy is not a victimless crime. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> right. You see that in every right. every single movie. You're like what the hell? Like, have you heard of Pirate Bay? <laughs> right. Exactly. The whole you know, I can somehow steal from I can steal from you by somehow. Um, you know, having a copy of something right. and I didn't pay the money for it. So, you know, somehow I prevented a sale that you never made. Mm -hmm. Only I didn't. Like, I didn't interrupt a sale. I just wasn't a sale that you could have had. But I decided not to pay for it. Like, not doing a thing is not stealing a thing. So, you can't steal, like, not paying for something that is a, a copy of something else where that person still owns all of that thing right, and, they have right. it. and it's just a copy of something else and you right. didn't pay for it. Right. You didn't steal from them. No. You just weren't an additional sale. And they're basically saying, no, like you should, you should have known that sometime in the future that money would have come to me. And I know, <laughs> I know the future and I know that money. I, I, I somehow would have made that. Right, right. So somehow you stole from me. Mm -hmm. No, you can't know the future. You can't know that you would have made all this money right. just because, you know, these, these people have copies of your stuff. So it's just the weird, again, control freak way people think. But I love that people are freeing themselves in every way they can. They're just sort of going, hmm, is there a way around that whole rule where you just decide you should be able to take my money and maybe I just don't give it to you? I'm going to find a way around that rule. Right. And that's what cryptocurrency is. It's people trying to go... I'm tired of you taking all of my income. <laughs> like, yeah. So I'm going to find a way around that because I'm really tired of you just skimming off of my time and energy and effort. And so people are just economically going, oh, well, government is annoying. So I want to <laughs> go around it. <laughs> exactly. And, and they're doing that. So that's really good to see. And I think that's awesome. And I think we'll see more of that. Excellent. So. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. Uh, before I even let you go, can you just uh, tell me, um, I asked all my guests uh, a favorite quote of yours that, that you like, or, or of anybody's, <laughs> not necessarily of yours, but uh, what, what is a favorite quote that you have that, uh, that you really like? Oh, man. I don't even know if I can say one. Mostly because I don't ever like quotes that are short. Really? <laughs> I don't like, not many. I mean, there are a few, but I will say... Ah, oh, I think, I think it's Henry David Thoreau's quote where he says um, that. I'll just paraphrase it, but <laughs> it's that the root of liberty is in disobedience. So the obedient must be slaves. Right, and that's right. one of my favorite quotes out there because the biggest, I think. Uh, mental fail of the program status is the belief that somehow obedience is this good thing that we should be really training people to be and that's just one of the most wrong things people believe yeah. just wrong so I think that's maybe my favorite short quote a lot of the other quotes I have I admit are like wordy it's like a paragraph by Larkin over here and a paragraph by Lysander Spooner and uh -huh. I always find stuff and I end up liking the section of words and <laughs> that so I can't just can't like quote these one-liners like quickly I can sort of paraphrase their thoughts but yeah, Henry I, David says a lot of good stuff that was one of my favorite lines yeah that reminds me of a Howard Zinn quote uh, which is the problem in the world is not um disobedience the problem is obedience <laughs> so along, yes. a, along a similar line um, yes but, awesome uh, conversation uh, Amanda thanks a lot for coming on the show really appreciate it um, so You're if welcome. anybody wants to follow your work um, how should they find you can you just repeat repeat your stuff again where they can find you um, my blog site which will have a lot more activity on it um, after Anarchapolco when I'm not getting ready for that uh, is uh, the dragonanarchist.com and then uh, my actual Facebook page is the dragon anarchist and my YouTube channel is the dragon anarchist um, and then I still have room to add friends on my personal page um, which will include you know other statuses not related to liberty like my other life stuff too but uh, it's Amanda Rockwitz and uh, my last name is spelled R-A-C-H-W-I-T-Z. So it doesn't actually look like how it sounds. But that's how you can get a hold of me if you want to. Friend me, I'll still add people. 
Awesome. Yes, please, uh, you know, connect with her, connect with all the liberty minded people. You know, I think the more that we can uh, network together, the, the greater our message will be, the, the greater our spread and outreach can be. Absolutely. So we have to connect. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, if anybody wants to help me out, you can you can help me out through PayPal, uh, Bitcoin or Patreon. Patreon is patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out i uh, love in- interviewing uh, wonderful people like amanda and i, w- I want to do more and monetary compensation is always encouraged and appreciated right <laughs> in anything that we do we <laughs> yeah respond, exactly we respond to incentives right <laughs> yeah well it's our time so our time is worth something exactly vote with your dollars the only democracy i support <laughs> awesome amanda thanks a lot for coming to the show uh, so this is um uh, peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and the seeds of liberty.com and the conscious resistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye.